I am Dr. Shobhana Patel. I am currently the chair of Karnataka chapter of ISA. I have with me Dr. Nivedita Shetty, who is the honorary secretary of ISA, and a renowned ERT specialist from Bangalore, Dr. Devika Gunashila. She is also is a co-founder member of ISA. So today we have two talk scheduled for this webinar. So the first talk is on junctional zone of uterus and enigma. and the second one is on polymorphism of lh and its receptors and their application to the clinical practice these are the topics which has really baffled most of the practitioners and they are seldom heard in the recent webinars to deliver these lectures we have an another enigmatic person dr ramma raju i have great pleasure in introducing dr ramma raju his fame has reached kesar earlier than him we wanted to get him to kesar for much earlier but somehow we could we couldn't uh, he couldn't make it he is a founder and director of krishna ivf clinic at visakhapatnam this is the first ivf clinic in the district of coastal andhra pradesh he has received training in ultrasonography and endoscopy and did assisted reproduction at wadia maternity hospital mumbai and kiel university of germany he is also specialized in icsi tesa and assisted hatching from uh, billfeld institute germany he has he he has a lot of uh, special bond bond with his mentor who is dr hans rudolf and he he has a lot of uh, gratification for him because it was him i believe he told me that he was exposed to genetics and animal lab and urology and oncology and he thinks that this interlink between all the specialties is very important because it gives you a different perspective of the problems what we see so because of because he has been mentored so very well he thought this mentorship programs are so important and he has a, he is offering mentorship program and he has mentored around 300 gynecologists across india currently he is a adjunct professor at the department of reproductive medicine at sri ramachandra university chennai he is a visiting professor at university of gesen in germany He is a PhD guide at the Department of Human Genetics, Andhra Pradesh, Andhra University, and he is also an investigator of uh, of Sam for Samsung, South Korea, and also on the Global Advisory Board for Merck in India and APAC. So he works with the very big names in uh, ERT like Robert Fisher and Carlo Alvighi. He has been working with them, and he has got several award. And is uh, today Krishna IVF Center is an, is considered as an extramural research center for research in Andhra University. He has got several awards and honors. The merit certificate by Indian Red Cross Society has been given by Honorable uh, Honorable Governor Ramesh Rameshwar Thakur. Samet ke Bharat Gaurav Sarkar by the Delhi Telugu Academy, and also in 2008 he has received gold silver medal for motivation of blood donors by Indian Red Cross Society. He does lot of philanthropy, and he has almost planted around 600 street plants. And he believes that philanthropy is something like a business. You know, you have to manage philanthropy is like a business. Every penny what you give is accountable. It's a, something very interesting he talks. And also his his uh, publications are something which uh, which is an inspiration, truly inspiration for all of us. He is an author of three textbooks and thirty one publications. He has publications on wide varieties of areas in high impact journals. He has written on many areas. Like he is not one of those researchers who work in one area and publish. many papers he has worked in a wide variety of areas like obesity dna fragmentation and lab pickup of oocyte aspiration and wide variety of thing and he also done something on periodontal status in infertility infertile women something very very interesting and the way he works is uh, you know i think we uh, we all need to i mean i think i must tell you because he he poses a clinical question and then he puts it as a research question he does this original work on it he publishes it and then he practices it and i think that that's a complete circle of learning on his own on his own merit on his own experience and i thought like a, a, you know we must all appreciate it and i have been interacting with him for the past couple of uh, days and uh, i found him is a very wise and a pleasing personality he thinks he is a loner and an odd man out but i found him very philosophical spiritual a great academician a thinker and a doer so ladies and gentlemen i welcome you all dr ramaraju 
and i warm welcome you to you sir and please make your presentation dr rama raju sir can you hear us station the station uh madam dr raju is just connecting to the audio he is just having some internet issues maybe a minute yeah. and i think he'll be able to share his slides sure sure Yes, madam. Yes, madam. Ready? Uh, sir, still connecting to audio. So the flow of the program is such that, like, first we will have one session, and then followed by uh, question and answers, and then we we'll take up the next session, and then we will go the question. We'll take the questions on polymorphism. just wait for a couple of minutes i think dr ramaraju is connecting Devika, you had done some research work with him, right? Earlier? No, we were only on the. Uh, he was heading the Merck Advisory Board for um, PCO, as well as uh, use of um, recombinant LH in uh, uh, for responders. So that was uh, where we had. Um, uh, there were plenty of consultants there, and we all had worked together. And with Dr. Ramaraju. Uh, Uh, heading the whole uh, board. This was a pan India study, is it? This was a pan India yes, study. Yes, yes, it was a pan India study. Okay. Um, and also, he was on the advisory board for the Asia Pacific Committee for uh, the use of uh, LH in, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, you know. And then uh, they brought out a a, a guideline, uh, mm -hmm. and it was involving the whole, you know, um, places like uh, uh, Thailand and. Uh, Mm, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and uh, you know uh, the whole Asia Pacific area, and uh, he was part of that committee. And then uh, those guidelines are very interesting actually to read. It's about the use of LH in yeah. those scenarios. Yeah, I was just going through all his publications. I wonder, like you know, in his busy practice, how he manages to make so many publications. Yeah, actually, I've been wanting to go and visit his unit, you know, and. Um, um i think it uh, i think definitely i think uh, if he allows it everybody should go <laughs> because it has i think he's very he's a very scholarly very research minded person and you said it very correctly you know it's a full circle you know he raises the question and he goes about trying to get the answer and then once he does get it he uh, you know finishes the circle by uh, implementing it in his own practice and i think he's going to be talking a lot about lh receptor polymorphism and uh, PCOS also this time I think and I think that is going to be really interesting because I've heard uh, some of his lectures before regarding this LH receptor and how it's going to help us to uh, tailor the dose of gonadotropins uh, for um, uh, stimulation in PCO. Yeah, you know, sometimes you have these uh, PCO poor responders, you know, uh, and then PCO hyper responders and PCO normal responders and things like that. So I think that is something that we might talk about. It'd be quite interesting to listen to that. And then collection of data. I think he has a huge data with him, and mm -hmm. I was just discussing with him. And uh, he was telling that he has a software he has, which he has got it from Boston University. He has a huge data of all the uh, embryo samples what he has done, and you know all the histoscopy what he has done. You know everything, each and every aspect of his uh, uh, work. He has he has a uh, collection uh, you know in his database. Okay. so i think another thing uh, which you know i thought like it's it was amazing like you know so that he can you know we can go back and then you know 
check uh, you know the go back and he has done a lot of retrospective study also and yeah. so can you know this database is very good that is what uh, you know oh, it's very interesting to have your own data and to kind of you know talk about your own practices and what has been applicable to you and uh, we all can learn from a lot from it because uh, reading from a textbook is a different story uh, and also reading from shall we say um uh, the studies from western or from western population is different yeah. i think we are a, i have always believed that we are a different uh, set of uh, uh, population as a whole and uh, we can't extrapolate everything that is done in the west and i think you have also uh, i think do you think on the same lines you think that we are different and we should have our own set of data and yeah. and the yeah. way that ram raj was going on is the is the way that we all should actually kind of you know follow with having our own data and publishing and talking about our own experience with our own patients not extrapolating somebody else's somebody else's experience in the west onto our practice true true very true very true and our women are entirely different like than what category of people we see and their profile and their ethnicity yeah. it matters yeah 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 I think there's some uh, uh, research on ethnicity and PC also. No? I, think. I think he joined. Yeah, I think he joined. Right? Yeah, I think so. Session. Yeah. Has he joined? Anil? Hello. Not it. Not it. Joined. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, sir. Sir has joined. Right. Very good. Okay. Hello. Yeah. You're able to hear me. Yes. 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 We can hear you. Yeah. Sorry. So your video is switched off. Might I request you to please start your video? You are able to hear me, no? Yeah, we can hear you. Now you are able to see me? No, we cannot see. You. No, no, madam is able to see me. Madam, you are able to see me now? No, we can't see you. But uh, can you share your slides, sir? Yes, yes. Have to turn off our video, Shobana. Turn off our video. Uh, is is that required? No, I don't think. I mean, you know, we can, we can. I mean, 
I don't know what's the issue. Had joined actually. Doesn't matter. We keep it on. I think he, even in case he cannot put his video on, he can just start talking. I suppose. Ma'am, there is some internet issue at first place. Okay. So, what do you think we should do? Should rectifying. Should we say we'll join back another ten minutes? What do you think we should do? Because our audience is there. So, might I request the audience to just hold back for the next five minutes? We should be joining in again. Sheshan, uh, can we request him to talk without the video? He can share the slides. Yeah, yeah. And he can uh, talk. He can talk without the video. <coughs> can we ask him to do that? Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yes, Doctor Raju, we can see you now, sir. Can we have a sound check from your side? Yeah. Uh, Doctor Raju, can you hear us? Uh, Madam Sir will be joining through the mobile, so okay. he should be he should be able to deliver the talk through that.
We are sorry about this. I request all the audience to hold on. He's just asking for five minutes, and he'll he'll join us. Then we can play from there. Shashan, is it okay? Like, if you if he if you can operate the slides, can could you ask him? He has sent the slide uh, deck to me, and I can share it with you. Yes, madam. You can share it to me. Yes, then I can ask uh, sir to connect through audio only. Yes. Are you able to talk to him? Jason? Yes, madam. Yes, madam. I'm able to talk to him. Do you want us to play the thing, slides? Uh, madam, actually, if you can share from your side, I'll ask sir to just deliver it through the audio. I, I can do it. Please ask him and he's not picking up the phone. Yeah. Okay. नमस्कार <laughs> 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 मैडम माइट आई रिक्वेस्ट यू टू शेयर द स्लाइड्स so that slide is very heavy so it's just reading my mail and that just a minute the moment it reaches my mail i'll open it apologies madam it's not in anybody's hand it happens <laughs> morning we had a dry run you just joined at 6 o'clock it was all right My slides are ready with me, madam. You're ready? My slides are ready with me. Oh, very good. Why can't you share the screen? 
So you can't share screen? Yeah. Right? Yes, sir. We can see your slides. We can. Good, good. Yes. So can you share the slides again? We can no longer see your uh, slides, sir. Yeah, I stopped it. Right? Yes, sir. Yeah, we can see. Please proceed, sir. Yeah, I can go ahead, madam. Yes, yes, please. Uh, first of all, I thank the Karnataka Reproductive Medicine Society, that is the KISAR, for giving me an opportunity to share some of my knowledge in the area of reproductive medicine. I have chosen two topics. One is the injection zone. The second is the role of LH in reproductive medicine. Both are important topics, both are diverse, both are in the forefront. We always uh, look at uterus, we always look at uterine anomaly, we always look at endometrium, but seldom we look at the junctional zone. We find junctional zone is the forefront and it makes a lot of difference in the area of reproductive medicine. And in this talk, I'll be guiding you through those journey. In this talk, I'll be basically speaking about a basic definition of junctional zone. What's the embryological significance of the junctional zone? What are the diagnostic modalities that are there in junctional zone? What is its implication on embryo, placenta, pregnancy-induced hypertension? What is its role in implantation? And what is its implications in uterine anomaly and the role of cesarean section, not for the least, the role of artificial intelligence in the area of junctional zone. Junctional zone is not a new topic. It has been almost uh, close to 36 years since the concept of junctional zone is being shouted by many of the pioneers but nobody stood to listen to them. Only recently, after the advent of 3D ultrasound, we started understanding the importance of junctional zone. As late as 1986, Flesher has defined junctional zone as a tissue layer which is hypoechoic compared to the outer myometrium. It's also called the myometrial halo. In 2000, Kunch et al. has defined junctional zone as a thickness about 3.5 millimeters plus or minus 1 millimeter as the upper limit of junctional zone beyond which it affects fertility. We are always trained to look at junctional zone as more than 10 millimeters, but that, that, that criteria is to explain the adenomyosis. If your junctional zone crosses 10 millimeters, then you're looking at endomyosis. But beyond, below that, there's a huge pathology and anything more than 3.5 millimeters of size of junction zone will have an impact, which I'll be describing as we go forward. The left side image shows the 2D ultrasound image, wherein we could not see in a 2D the different layers of the junctional zone. And in the right side, with the advent of transvaginal ultrasound, we could look at the myometrium, the endometrium, and the intermediate layer, the junctional zone. This intermediate layer is a functional layer through which the myometrium and the, and the endometrium send signals and has a huge vascularity, which makes it an important organ but seldom studied, which I'm going to highlight in the next couple of minutes. What is the embryological origin of junctional zone? This subendometrial myometrium is thought to originate from the paramesoenopteric ducts 
and the bulk of the outer myometrium forms on the non paramesomatic mesenchymal tissue and this was elaborated in a publication in human reproduction in in 1999 by no at all and they could show that by both by the mri and by the immunohistochemistry study that this layer is a unique layer i'll be coming into that point why it's unique layer as you see this figure the paramesonephric duct or the mullerian duct from the key area in the developmental of the uterus the red area is the paramesonephric duct and the green area is the wolfian duct which disappear as they develop and as you see in the picture c you have the non cannulation of the uterus and as you see in the picture d the uterus gets cannulized and the paramesonephric ducts line the endometrium also called the junctional zone this has importance in the area of uterine malformations because seldom we look at uterine malformations from an embryological point of view we only look at from a myometrium point of view and try to cut off what we find as an obstruction in the process we try to destroy many things another important facet is we we never ask ourselves why do only some mammals menstruate the mammals that menstruate are the human beings the primate and the bat and one or two other mammals this is because these placenta have a much more larger blood flow and cross the endometrium and into the myometrium to tap the vessels for example in a normal uterus the amount of blood flow is 2% when in, in a in a human placenta at term the amount of blood flow blood flow is as much as 25% of the cardiac output this makes a huge difference why did the importance of junction zone come earlier years mri which is shown in the left picture with the small arrow showing the endometrium the medium arrow showing the junctional zone and the larger arrow showing the myometrium since our access to mri was quite difficult and it's been quite expensive we did not use it as a routine tool but with the advent of 3d ultrasound you're seeing the endometrium you're seeing the myometrium and the junctional zone this new imaging technique has made us understand that junctional zone is an important structure and we did not give the importance it is due and even in histopathology the amount of muscular layer that is present in the junctional zone is very scanty compared to the rest of the myometrium and hence it's a it's a distinct entity from the endometrium and the myometrium the architecture of the uterus looks like this and when you look at the junctional zone image the left side image is a 2d image wherein you can see a myometrium you can see a my endometrium and most of the time we always keep arguing what is 10 mm 8 mm or 6 mm but seldom look at this area of uh, hypoic area called junctional zone because it plays a key role in implantation and in many health conditions of the woman with the advent of 3d ultrasound this this hypoic area is is making us understand the role of junctional zone junctional zone is comp composed of less amount of muscle fibers and these muscle fibers are larger in size have larger nuclei making it hypoechoic in its imaging here is another image of the junctional zone where you can see the junctional zone as i am pointing my arrow and here in the left side image of 2d you just find a triple line but you won't be able to identify the junctional zone so the role of junctional zone after the advent of 3d ultrasound 
has completely changed the evaluation of the uterus. The next thing is the junctional zone are, has a highly vascular structure through which the blood vessels go into the endometrium and the junctional zone vascularity makes a lot of difference and we are just beginning to understand and study the junctional zone of the vascular of the endometrium of the vascularity of the junctional zone these implications are in the assessment of the endometrium in the assessment of uh, uh, pre-implantation of pregnancy induced hypertension where there is an abnormality of the junctional zone and the vascularity where the spiral vessels do not undergo the desired amount of dilatation and in turn produce pregnancy induced hypertension and the further implications are in the area of endometrial carcinoma if your, if your myometrium infiltration crosses the junctional zone the possibility of having a lymph node possibility in endometrial carcinoma is high so the implications of junctional zone studies in future will be in the area of implantation, in the area of pregnancy induced hypertension and in the area of endometrial carcinoma. Here is another image where you are seeing the junctional zone. Where, where you are seeing the junctional zone. Where you are seeing the endometrium and this is a junctional zone. You can evaluate by different tools that are present. In an interesting article in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology titled The Uterine Zone, a three-dimensional ultrasound study of patients with endometriosis and endomyosis, they found that disruption of the junctional zone architecture is associated with hyperplasia that seems to precede endomyosis and it also alters the coordinated peristaltic activity of the inner myometrium. That means if your junctional zone is abnormal, a uterine peristalsis is altered, which in turn may affect your implantation. The second important point is junctional, junctional zone increases with age. From 20 to 50, there's a gradual increase. The other aspect is junctional zone on the day one of the cycle is different on day 12 of the cycle is different. So we should understand junctional zone has an age differentiation. Junctional zone has a cycle differentiation. And third thing is junctional zone is abnormal in sickness of the uterus. Here you're seeing a classic picture. On the left side, you see a uterus, which is bulky and you can vaguely see an outline of the abnormality in the posterior wall of the uterus. But when you see on the right side, as I point out my, my image, we are looking at the cervix, we are looking at the body of the uterus, and this is the uterine cavity, and this is where the uterus has undergone a, a breach of the junctional zone, and this is where you are seeing the endomyosis. Here what happens is, in future, we might have treatments to have a treatment here because at this moment, what we are trying to do is, we are trying to remove as much as possible of the endomyotic area, but it is coming down. This is a classic example showing that a breach of my junction zone produces endomyosis, which is very clear in this picture. These disturbances of junctional zone can produce an injury and multiple injury can alter the Cox estradiol pathway which will, which will in turn increase the angiogenesis proliferation and then produce augmented hyperperistalsis. What are the implications of junctional zone abnormality? In the mouse experimentation, when the junctional zone is abnormal. They found that there, 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 there is an increase in the interleukin production, which in turn increases the thickness of the junctional zone and it impairs the gestational capacity. 
in patients undergoing assisted reproduction technique thickening of the junction zone is a negative predictor of implantation and in the earlier years women exposed to diuretic cerebrospinal had altered thickening of the junction zone these are some of the evidence we have in history a little about uh, the workers who did good amount of work in the junction zone bronson at all from the last 30 years has kept on publishing the importance of junction zone initially he studied junction zone through the mri subsequently studied the histopathology and now moved into the uterus and one should read his papers to understand the importance of junction zone and he in the earlier years was able to say the impact of adenomyosis now in his recent papers he is able to say the impact of junction zone abnormality in implantation and in the area of uh, repeat persistent failure this is a classic uh, publication which one should read this is from the human reproduction update where the article title name is junction zone and enigma where they clearly define the role of junction zone and in one of the slides they have described the implications of junction zone on the placenta and in turn on the area of pre eclampsia here in the left side corner you are seeing the radial vessels the spiral vessels and in the normal situation these vessels increase in size but when there is a junctional zone abnormality the radial and the basal artery and part of the spiral artery do not undergo dilatation hence the implication of junctional zone is there both in the area of implantation and also in the area of pregnancy induced hypertension here in this slide you are seeing the dilatation but we have been all the years looking at only the uterine artery but never the the radial or the spiral arteries in assessment of the blood flows we should start looking at the spiral vessel blood flow in relation to radial artery and in relation to uterine artery to get a complete picture in the in the doppler studies which we do in pregnancy we only see the blood flows here and try to look at the pattern but seldom look at at this point and at this point to identify the early changes which might hamper the implantation when it comes to assisted reproduction we need three things a good sperm a good oocyte which should reproduce a good embryo a good receptive endometrium of which endometrial receptivity is one component junction zone is a second component and the fourth component is a good embryo transfer in 2019 we did a study along with samson in predicting the implantation success using junction zone assessment in assisted reproduction in this study what we did was we serially measured the junction zone from day 1 to day 10 and also the endometrial line, endometrial thickness of the same patients and the conclusions were junctional zone changes throughout the stimulation cycle and there is a difference of junctional zone in the pregnant and the non pregnant women and the sensitivity of junctional zone may predict implantation success which i'll be able to explain in the next slide when we take a junction zone we measure all the three planes the right the fundus and the left and in this study what we did was as the simulation happened on from day 3 we started measuring the junction zone and the endometrium throughout the cycle and we were in for some surprises this slide shows the endometrial thickness from day 1 to day 14 the the red line reflects the pregnancy and the blue line reflects the non pregnant and in endometrium is not a predictor whether 
whatever the endometrium is it does not differentiate between a pregnant and a non pregnant when you see this slide the average junction zone thickness as the days go by it is increasing the orange line is the non pregnant the pre orange line is the pregnant and the blue line is non pregnant and you see that this line is much lesser than the pregnant women and the cut off levels are 2.6 mm at the at the time of hcg in the pregnant group and 3.3 in the non pregnant group and what we were surprised was this tendency has started much much from the third day this difference the practice we are doing at this point was if the junctional zone is very high then we are trying to plan the embryo transfer in the subsequent cycle only in selected groups but not in every group whereas uh, when the junctional zone is normal in this pa pattern we do the embryo transfer we do not routinely plan frozen embryo transfer for every, every patient only in selected patients we do a frozen embryo transfer instead of a fresh cycle a further example of this thing is the here the pregnant group is a blue line which is both in the fundus area the right lateral the left lateral and the average thickness is always lower compared to the higher group this shows that junctional zone rises throughout the cycle and higher the junctional zone throughout the possibility of implantation but further studies are needed to elaborate this concept to say it can be used in routine practice why we started using it but we are finding the benefit but still some more groups should work and say and endorse this publication to say and to be universally used as a tool this is how we measure the junctional zone the next thing is the uterine anomaly at this present moment of time the uterine anomalies are classified by the asrm by the european group but we don't have a uniform classification the classification is based on the endometrial cavity rather than the junctional zone we feel using the junctional zone might be useful in classifying the junctional zone because what happens is the first image is a normal uterus where you have the junctional zone thickness uniform all throughout this is a deviated uterus and this is a unicornate uterus and this is a bicornate uterus and this is a uterine didelphus and the last one is the endomyosis imagine if we cut this junctional zone we are harming them in the long run till now whatever people propagate is we need a large space of uterine cavity and cut off this thing if we cut off the junctional zone in the short run we are not understanding its implications but in the long run we might produce harms which none of the studies have addressed till now the other area is in the cesarean scar assessment till now once we do a cesarean section we in the retrospective history we can only ask the patient whether he had post operative morbidity and then bleeding but using junctional zone you can assess the degree of scarring of the scar and assess the whether she will have a weak scar at the site of the niche area and also what we found was when the niche area is very large we found it also impacts the junctional zone this we published it in the international society of obstetrics and gynecology world congress in 2009 where we said predicting disturbance of junctional zone in cesarean section deliveries and impact on subsequent uh, for in infertility and a possible endometriosis here this tool helps us to automate the junctional zone assessment and the degree of scar and the degree of deviation 
what is the role of uh, artificial intelligence in junctional zone we have been working with samsung from 2016 in the area of developing applications for ultrasound and one of the area we worked is in the junctional zone in relation to as a implantation predictor as a possible classification of uh, uterine anomalies assessment of the cesarean scar and now we move to one step forward of making it easy for everybody to assess the junctional zone in this what we did was we mapped hundreds and thousands of images and then taught the machine how to look at it here we plotted the junction zones in the different planes and taught the machine that this is an abnormal junction zone beyond it and then using the machine learning language and the python the samson team who develop an algorithm and then the results are this is the upper image i did it using the volume acquisition and this is the image the machine made, made only giving the volume image and no landmarks that means uh, in future if somebody just puts a probe acquires the volume the machine will make similar images and give us a good information we are the outs- the work we did along with this area is apart from looking at the endometrium we tried to identify the contour of the junctional zone and we are also able to identify the degree of blood vessels that are there in the junctional zone and and trying to make a quantitative assessment this work which we submitted to the optics and gynec green journal was taken as a cover co- cover image wherein because they felt this work has future implications in many areas and in solely question of another 3 4 years you'll see most of the machines will be able to give you an acquired image of the uterus mark the junction zone into yellow and then mark the blood vessel intensity as red and give you a comprehensive information which is similar to the iot index which you find in the oncology this will help us to really understand the junctional zone finally i am indebted to my patients who taught me everything in the past 25 years and we work with samson together for for the last 5 years and i encourage all the junior members of the society to look at translational research go and look out and see other technologies and people who are working so that you are able to develop cross functional research which will solve many problems the conclusions of this lecture is junction zone has an importance you should start learning to take junction zone using 3d you should analyze junction zone in relation to implantation failure in relation to uterine anomalies in relation to pregnancy induced hypertension and also understand that the future of junction zone might be in the area of endometrial carcinoma also and also understand artificial intelligence is also entering the field of junction zone so that it might make things easier for all of us to analyze and understand junction zone i thank one and all and i am open for questions thank you sir am i audible yeah yeah i have given a portion of the lecture so that there will be many questions so that i will be able to answer them sure sir so thank you sir for the enlightening talk it was brilliant i mean i did a lot of reading after deciding on this topic I, I, but i didn't come across so many uh, pictures it's amazing sir i'm really impressed that so much of advancement artificial intelligence to predict implantation is brilliant this is really, really amazing we are so glad we have you here today and uh, at this of course i must mention to the audience also i mentioned this to you earlier that you yourself have been an, en- an enigma to us and uh, we are so uh, impressed and so honored to have you with us uh, we have a few questions from the audience uh, 
we have uh, you will be sharing the yeah can uh, can you stop sharing the screen sir yeah yeah i think i stop sharing okay yeah we made a powerpoint slide of the question and answers the first question is endometrial receptivity is altered in adenomyosis so do you advocate endometrial receptivity era ara that is era for women with rif and adenomyosis so what is your opinion about era sir uh era is all about endometrium and era is about at that moment of time and uh, one of the thing that keeps on bothering me about era is if it is done in the particular cycle it's worthwhile if it is done in a previous cycle i have my own doubts about its efficiency and uh, era should be practiced in a facility where you get the report immediately so that you use it in that cycle where the endometrium is receptive you do the transfer if the endometrium is not receptive plan another cycle uh the second thing is there are uh, arise has its own limitations its negative predictability is very less but its positive predictability is good uh but when you are using that information in the next cycle i am not sure what's the relevance of its negative predictability in the next cycle so they do claim that it's uh, consistent the era report in uh, subsequent cycles also is consistent that is what the claim is from the uh, one thing is array is for array information is for that particular cycle and uh, if array is abnormal we manipulate certain things and make it good in the next cycle then uh, that means things are changing in the next cycle okay yeah okay and i'm saying is array is a wonderful tool but its relevance is in that particular cycle you get the best value so can i just interject you so you don't use it is that correct i mean in most of your patients or do you use it as a last resort tool i, st- I studied the uh, and i also studied the european group which have also st- produced some genes uh if i had it in wisaik or in hyderabad where i get the report tomorrow then i'll use it otherwise the answer is no okay okay so the next question is uh, will ultra long down regulation protocol help in improving art outcome in adenomyosis there there, uh, there are two things for this for many years practically 90% of my work is long protocol and uh, uh in endometriosis the literature says in endometriosis and endometriosis long protocol gives a better result the reason is it decreases the volume of the uterus in endometriosis our protocol is if you have a 200 ml uterus we give gnrh so that we bring down the uterus volume to less than 150 ml and then only start the stimulation Uh, i don't have any scientific proof to prove that my i uh, mean uh, this is an ideal way but that is what we do we try to if the endometrial volume is less than 150 ml we use any protocol the patient requ- requests when it's more than 150 ml we insist that they take two doses of gnrh and see that the endometrial volume comes down then do a hysteroscopy and see that the anterior wall or the posterior wall is not grossly abnormal before we take them for ivf um uh, i'm not sure whether this question is very relevant but then um i'm seizing this opportunity to ask you um uh, have you looked at the i mean in adenomyosis of course you you said that the junctional zone is, is junctional zone is going to be disturbed is that correct yes 
Yeah. So when you do a down regulation and an ultra long down regulation, have you found any difference in that? I mean, you talked about the volume of the adenomyosis and the uh, and the uterine volume coming down. So is there any effect on that junctional zone, or is there nothing like that? Uh, there, there is a slight effect, but what happens is we also use the hysteroscopy to assess after the down regulation to to look at the number of openings that are there in the anterior or the posterior wall. and if there are significant number of uh, abnormal endometrial abnormal endometrial pattern i expect less pregnancy rate and i discuss with the patient that look we have a lower prognosis but when the pathology is low if i do a surgery i have a window period of 2 years by which time the endometriosis comes back and there i am looking at a situation where uh if i go up front and do a surgery i give a time limit of only 2 years before the endometriosis comes back if i don't do a surgery i need i need more number of embryos and more number of cycles to get a pregnancy so it's a balance between those two in consultation with the patient i don't think i answered your question perfectly uh <laughs> I mean, the answer is in my practice. Uh, uh, whenever the endometrium cavity comes down below 150, I find the endometrium, the hysteroscopy looks closer to normal. If it's a 350 or a 400 ml uterus, and it comes down to 200 or 150, when I look look at hysteroscopy, I'm still unhappy. Yeah, but but the thing is that I'm I'm just wondering about the junctional zone because you were saying that the junctional zone is very important uh, and and is one of the markers because if your junctional zone is thickening, then there's not going to be that much of a pregnancy. So a thinner junctional zone, I think, would be the way to go. Is that correct? I I mean, please correct me if I'm wrong, because if you have a thinner junctional zone, you're going to it's more likely that you're going to have a pregnancy. And is there a cut off for the junctional zone? I mean, I know that you said that a lot more work has to be done, but then. uh the, the the pregnancy rates that were there were 3.3 mm of junctional zone and above after the implantation but yeah. what is in adenomyosis no way you can get that figure it's going it's always going to be more more there uh, 3.3 does not say it will not implant but there is a significant decrease in the pregnancy rate mm-hmm. okay so there uh men uh It's the choice between the woman having her own uterus for transfer, which I would always prefer, I mean, rather than surrogacy. Yeah, But yeah. You tell them you have a higher chance of uh, premature delivery mm. and higher chance of antipartum hemorrhage. Mm. Okay. Yes, sir. The next question is: In whom would you advocate adenomyomectomy? and have you any experience of this uh, in the pregnancy later does it have any effect uh it's like this like uh when the ut- when the uterus is uh, 300 to 500 ml uh volume and uh, the the endomyoma is close is close to the I mean, as a large segment of endometrium is close to the endometrium that's when i i i mean uh, i prefer a endomyomectomy but my preference is it's a open laparotomy procedure where i'm more comfortable but if the patient insists that i want a laparoscopy then i would suggest him suggest him to go to gorian joseph whose suturing skills are far superior i mean uh, i mean like any great endoscopic surgeon will do a better job but my personal preference if the patient gives leaves me a choice for everything i would prefer an open endomyomectomy so that my suturing is far superior in relation to that situation i am the best in this situation and is it it's more for a localized endomyoma rather than a diffuse endomyoma is that correct both both i use the clap technique uh, i mean uh, the double blue breasted technique to cover the endometrium which is the large endomyoma there we do a preoperative preparation with down regulation for gnrh for 3 months and then only go for the surgery 
but I tell the patient that we have a window period of two years and we have to wait for 12 to 16 weeks before we plan the first cycle and I don't, I don't want any gap and you should assure me two or three cycles before you say I call it a day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's always a risk of rupture in pregnancy, you know, sir. Isn't that correct with an adenomyomectomy? Yes, but what happens is, uh, luckily we did not have it, but the answer is yes. So if you have, if you do an adenomyomectomy and you want to, um, you allow, I mean, she gets pregnant, and so to, when would you deliver her? Approximately, I mean, if she, if it's going on all, all right, maybe an early delivery would be the way. Is that correct? Early delivery. What, what we're doing, what we're doing is in couple of situations. Uh, we are doing an MRI in the beginning of the pregnancy and then uh, discussing with my radiology colleague whether he can look at the, uh, the uterine muscle architecture in relation to the weakening area to the first MRI where I insist them to keep the, the MRI films on the, on the hard disk so that we can compare these two things. But the answer is I would prefer a patient with a large in no Miami, to be hospitalized at 34, 36 weeks and deliver at 36, 38 weeks or earlier or depending on the situation. Yeah. 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 So, okay. The next question is, uh, in adenomyosis patients, very often the demarcation between endometrium and myometrium is hazy or lost. How do you manage such patients and what is your experience? Uh, can I go back to my image? I'm going back to my image of this thing. So shall I stop sharing the, I'll stop sharing the slides. Yeah, yeah. So you need to share it. Here what happens is, here it looks as if the whole uterus is changed. Whereas here you are finding a small area where the adenomyosis, the junction zone is broken. And there, if you have a preoperative assessment like this, then you try to look at for this point and then try to minimize the damage to the endometrial cavity as much as possible. Here you are seeing the, even though it looks as if the endomyosis is here, but when you look at here, the endomyosis has disturbed the endometrium only at this point. So if you, when I do a surgery, if I have this image in front of me, it makes things little more better in preserving or disturbing the endometrial cavity to a far little extent. I think we are not convinced. Because when you see this image, this is where it is disturbed. Here, when you see this image, you find a whole area that is disturbed. So this image is better than this image when you are operating. I mean, these are such fantastic images and what kind of a machine is this? I mean, we never, I mean, my hospital got hit my head. I will never get this kind of an image. Yeah. So the management is the same. The surgery is the same. You remove the entire adenomyoma. Adenomyoma, but here what happens is I'm very careful when I dissect here. Yes. And I also put in the methylene glue here before I do a surgery. So that I don't open it too much. If I open it, then I say that I failed rather than the patient failed. Yeah. And uh, here what happens is, one other thing is, we never tell our radiologists what we want and how good the image should be. And we accept whatever images they give. <laughs> if they don't know also what we want, what are we doing? <laughs> That answer is not of much help, sir. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, we must send all our sonologists to you. <laughs> what happens is, uh, one of the sad thing is, we have a lot of ultrasound societies and a lot of ultrasound groups on the WhatsApp, but no one speaks about a non-pregnant uterus. We are only bothered about the fetus head and the CMS abnormalities and the cardiac abnormalities. Yeah, true. And we are we are I mean, we are not going a step be before that the uterus. And uh, one other I mean, uh, thing is, uh, uh, in future we should be able to look at the uterine blood flows of each of the fibroid and assess the distortion. Okay. So can we stop sharing the screen? Yeah, yeah. Can we stop sharing the screen? We have more questions pouring from the audience. I think you've answered this question has been answered. The next question is, um, many recurrent IVF patients have adenomatic large uteri. Is the junction zone always affected in these patients? And what's your advice, surrogacy, medical or surgical management? I think sir has pretty much an answered this question. Yeah. So would you monitor the effect of endometrial receptivity by monitoring endometrial peristal peristalsis on ultrasound? Yeah. Uh if you are doing an if you are doing an embryo transfer on the fourth or the fifth day with progesterone, the amount of endometrial peristalsis will get reduced. Most of the time, uh, among, mo most of the time, what happens is uh, if you are doing a day three embryo transfer, still the progesterone does not suppress it. Uh, if in spite of uh, your progesterone and on the day five you still find endometrial ca cavity movements. I don't think you have a perfect answer for that thing and you should expect a low pregnancy rate in those groups. So you, you are not measuring you mean? No, no. When, 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 when you are looking at endometrial uh, monitor, uh, peristalsis, hmm. you seldom see it on the day five of progesterone. Okay. Okay. There's a small catch here. COVID, since COVID has come, we've been like, uh, there have been studies which said that the day five blastocyst has a, the chances of COVID being are higher. So now we're encouraging day three transfers. So that has been a little bit of a catch 22 situation here. Whether to do a day three or a day five since the COVID situation is here. One thing is, till now, uh, with due respects to COVID, we don't have data about the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. We have only data since, since January and we only have data which shows between 26 and 34 weeks it's dangerous for the pregnant woman to have COVID. But in the pre in the pre era, uh, I would criticize myself for starting an IVF for the following reason. We are assuming that it does not have any consequences. And uh, we are assuming that it's all right to do an IVF transfer. Since I don't have a perfect answer, I'm only offering services. I am doing an IVF cycle with caution, telling that the woman that I don't have any information about the effect of COVID and pregnancy. And uh, uh, it's a choice you have to make. And I'm open to postponing it for a couple of months or six months. But uh, I leave it to you. No, I, I, I agree with that because I feel that I don't think we would even go in for a transfer if a woman or pick up if a woman was COVID positive. I mean, you may transfer later on. But even doing a COVID positive uh, patient, uh, doing a pickup, I don't do. I don't, I don't know if anybody does, but definitely I don't do it. I cancel the cycle. Uh, I do COVID, but the unfortunate thing in Vizag is at this point, the positivity rate outside 
when they're doing a COVID test is 60%. Mm. We'll what? move on to the next question, sir, on adenomyosis. In women who has conceived after treatment for adenomyosis, what are the pregnancy complications? I think this also we... I think we did cover that. Partly, you want to add anything, sir? I mean, uh, I would, I would, I mean, uh, I would consider uh, adenomyosis uh, pregnant women with or without surgery as a high risk of delivery. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Which type of adenomyosis has better prognosis, focal or the diffuse one? Uh, I, I mean, uh, I don't have a particular knowledge in that focal or the diffuse because uh, we didn't classify our group into focal or diffuse when we looked at the result. Uh, but assuming it's a focal, the size of the uterus will be much lesser uh, uh, compared to a diffuse adenomyosis. But we have uh, we have data about the volume of the uterus and IVF outcome, but we don't have a data between focal and diffuse adenomyosis. So your decision for surgery is based on the volume of the uterus. The presence of the adenomyoma, the size of the adenomyoma doesn't matter. It's a volume of is, uh, Your normal uterus is 30 to 60 ml. And when the adenomyosis makes the uterus double, your my myometrium thickness has grossly increased. And uh, there, there are a couple of papers showing myometrial thickness and IVF outcome. Okay. So, would do you recommend single embryo transfer in this group of patients? Uh, we routinely do till till uh, uh, a year back two embryo transfer and early a third embryo transfer. But the advent of time lapse imaging has made us reduce the number of embryos to one or rarely two. So, it depends on the quality of the embryo you have is also an important criteria. In adenomatic patients, I don't want to have a twins. Exactly. But my selection method earlier was poor, so I used to transfer two or rarely third embryo. For the past one year, I have reduced it to one or rarely two embryos. So my answer is reduce the embryos to avoid the twin pregnancy rate. Okay, so we have some more questions from the chat box. Uh, what is the cutoff value of thickness of uh, junction zone on the day of starting HRT in frozen embryo transfer cycle. This is Sirisha Sankara. Cut off value for thickness of uh, junction zone on the day of starting HRT in FET cycle. Uh, I mean, the, uh, when you look at the table, the starting junction zone thickness is around two, I mean, uh, around 1.5 to 2 millimeters. Uh, at the time of the bleeding, suppose if you take day one or day two in the menstrual cycle, your endometrium junction zone is very thin. It will be a, it will be less than uh, one point five mill millimeters or less. Okay, okay, thank you. Next, next question is from Smita Singh. She is asking us how junctional zone can be assessed in a two D scan. If you do not have a three D scan. How do you assess the junction uh, zone in a 2D scan? I don't think we can do a junction zone assessment in a 2D scan. Okay, the cannot be done. Okay, Dr. Rita Biliangri is asking, is, that, is it that the pathogenesis of adenomyosis lies in the alteration of junctional zone? The answer is yes. If you look at Bronson's paper, uh, he has published close to 25 papers in the last 20 years. And uh, he has been shouting, junctional zone is important. Only the last five years, he has been given his importance that is due. Okay. Because earlier he was looking at MRI and other people did not have access to MRI. And 2D did not show any difference. Only with the advent of widespread usage of 3D, now we are able to look at junctional zone and then uh, answer that thing. So the question is for 2D ultrasound, we can't see a junctional zone. Okay. Okay. So we will take up the next question. The next question is on again 2D scan. You have already answered that. So with the, uh, Dr. Madhuri Patil, most research has shown that error analysis is valid for three years. So what is your comment on that? I repeat the question, please. Dr. Madhuri Patil, 
She has a question. Most research has showed that error analysis is valid for three years. Uh, uh, and if the error analysis is three years and it comes negative, that means, is that meaning that she won't conceive for three years? Mm -hmm. No, no. I think like what we said, what you said, it's, uh, it is valid only for that cycle. It is not applicable for the next cycle. So what uh, the report, the research has been done, they are telling that if you have done error, that the, the results can be held uh, correct, like, you know, for, uh, for almost three years. Uh, if, if the, the answer at the opposite round, if the error test is negative. Okay. Uh, Simon and group does not say to stop the cycle. No, they tell you which day to do it. If say day 17 is the wrong day, they'll tell you post-receptive or pre-receptive. So you correct your day for the transfer. That's how it goes. So that's how they claim that it is consistent for, consistent for the next three years. That's what, at least quite a lot of publications are there which say so. So you do not agree with that? No, no, I'm saying yes. Uh, uh, I'll put the question this way. If the error test comes negative, are we advising them to stop the treatment? We're changing the day of transfer. We're correcting the day of transfer. The so prospective day. The statement uh, that you said is valid for three years may not be right. Okay. Okay. Uh, what is the best time to see the junctional zone in the non-pregnant? No, no. You can see it any time from day one to day ten. But the size of the junction zone varies throughout the menstrual cycle. Mm, okay. How often do you think that an altered junction zone could be the cause of unexplained implant implantation failure? Uh, uh, what we do is, uh, I mean, uh, if you have a good embryo, your stimulation is good, and uh, your follicle to oocyte output rate is good and you have a 70% uh, uh, fertilization rate and at least two or three good embryos and then you have an abnormal junctional zone, maybe th then I'll give importance. It's not a single factor. Can you, can you just tell us what abnormalities of the junctional zone adversely affect implantation? Do you have any specific answer or like whatever you are told so far, like that holds good? You know, we've, we've just presented the data that a larger junctional zone closer to 3.5 or more on the day of HCG has a lower implantation. Okay. But it's not all or none phenomena. It's a general rule that it has a lower implantation. So that data can be used for failure analysis. Okay. So next question is, is there a difference between the junctional zone values between an IVF stimulation cycle and an HRT cycle? Uh, I don't have much experience in comparing that, but whatever work I did was only in the IVF stimulation cycle. But the values which I presented in the graph might be different when you're given estrogens. Uh, but I don't have an answer for that question because I didn't work on that. Okay. And next question, I think you already answered focal adenoma versus diffuse adenoma, which is worse in terms of pregnancy outcome. You did say that you didn't look at that. you didn't look at that aspect of that parameter when you did your studies. Like most of the time, what we're looking at is we are looking at uterine volume mm -hmm. rather than uh, the focal and the diffuse adenomyosis, and we are also looking at in terms of extent of the uh, endometrium alteration that occurs in different types of adenomyosis. But we didn't specifically concentrate on five focal or diffuse. Okay. I think the last question is, do you use intraoperative ultrasonography while doing adenomyomectomy? Because you did show that uh, diagram, that picture. So they want to know, do you use intraoperative ultrasonography while doing adenomyomectomy? No, no, no. We have an ultrasound during the theater, but we seldom needed it because we, we prefer to do an open uh, adenomyomectomy for large adenomyosis. Okay. I think we are done with the questions, Devika. Yeah. I should, I think, uh, I'll now request Dr. Devika to invite Dr. Ramaraju for the next talk, which again is an enigma that is LH polymorphism, LH receptor polymorphism and its clinical applications. Yeah. Um, 
I think this is going to be an extremely interesting talk. Uh, and uh, I, I, we all know that uh, you know tailoring ovarian stimulation to the, an individual patient can be very challenging because of uh, substantial variation in the ovarian response. And pharmacogenetics has um, you know emerged as a new area of research. And I think uh, Dr. Ram Raju is the one who's leading the country forward in this, at least in the field of reproductive medicine. And I have heard him. And it is very, very interesting, especially with the amount of work, original work that he has done on the LH receptor uh, polymorphism. And uh, some, you know, it is, it is really interesting. It's mind blowing, actually, yeah, because he's now, I think, sir, you're going to be talking about how you can use this LH receptor polymorphism to tailor your ovarian stimulation. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, yes, yeah. I have heard this and it is simply superb and it is and I and I do not know if it is ready to be used commercially and we can all kind of uh, make use of it. So we are, um, we are very uh, uh, interested and definitely I'm very interested to listen to this uh, again and I'm sure there'll be many, many more new things to learn from you, sir. So hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Visible? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I thank for the extreme interest that was shown in the previous lecture, Junctional Zone. And uh, I'll be sharing some of the articles uh, on Junctional Zone to Dr. Shobha, where it can be redistributed because of copyright issues. I'll be sending it to Dr. Shobha. And uh, in the area of pharmacogenomics, uh, when you look at the Human Genome Project, even though it was uh, ready by 2003, the oncology groups have used the Human Genome Project to a large extent and they have re redefined their classification and used pharmacogenomics in the management of cancer. The reproductive medicine fraternity have lagged behind using the technological advances in the use of uh, cross-functional research and the use of pharmacogenomics and the proteomics and other things into the main spectrum. We have been uh, satisfied with our IVF stimulation, the pregnancy rates, but we have not gone in using the newer technologies, be it pharmacogenomics, be it proteomics, be it genomics. We are fortunate in having uh, the, one of the first publications in the area of pharmacogenomics in the world, but that's just a blip on the horizon and many more works will come in in the coming years. In this uh, lecture, I'll be basically concentrating on what is ongoing hyperresponder, what is LH gene, what is, what is uh, LHCGR gene, what are the common polymorphisms? What is the role of uh, LH polymorphism in LH supplementation? What are the studies we did? What are the key findings that are there? What are the possible mechanisms of this receptor? And what are the follow-up studies we did after the publication? In ovarian simulation, even though we have crossed 40 years, of ovarian stimulation, we have not at fine tuned the art of ovarian stimulation. We have predictability issues, we have too many protocols, we don't have a perfect monitoring tools during stimulation. In the last 40 years, the except for the estradiol levels and the ultrasound, we don't have monitoring tools during stimulation. 
and then lot of times we end up ending in poor responder or over responder all because at this moment the current markers we use to do a stimulation are not very efficient for example when you take the starting dose of a stimulation we don't have a perfect marker to say this is a starting dosage and many people use age fsh bmi antral follicle count amh and ovarian volume as one or more markers and the last 5 years these are more into more into age amh or afc as a primary markers and this led to a situation of some improvement but not a perfect improvement we don't have a formula saying this is a dosage you give to this patient and this is the follicle to oocyte yield you get it uh the one if one has to perfectly do a perfect ovarian simulation they should individually judge themselves what is the follicles that are there and what is the oocyte output that is there at the end of the cycle if you are, if you keep on auditing your results in that context your stimulation protocol will improve just because we got 15 oocytes we say we are satisfied but is the 15 oocytes of 15 follicles or 25 follicles which you picked up 15 oocytes and then uh, how many times did you change the dosage during the cycle and uh, was your dose constant to the cycle all these make a difference and what is the chances of hyper responder in a simulation protocol compared to anticipation and what is the risk of over response in a patient whom you don't anticipate should over respond these are the key performance indicators one should start taking into so that that will improve our outcome one of the best papers i want all of you to read is the article by pc wong in 2011 the title of the review article is current opinion on the use of luteinizing hormone supplementation in assisted reproductive therapy an asian perspective i was fascinated to be part of the this team of pc wong in this review article but the major contribution of this article goes to pc wong i also want you to remember apart from being a great clinician and from the singapore university he was also the co pioneer of the gift technology along with uh, uh, ash in usa he and uh, ash have published the first paper on the gift technology so he is a legend in his own way and in this article the concept of ls supplementation was divided into two groups in the present cycle and in the next cycle in the present cycle there is a concept called ongoing hyper responder what is ongoing hyper responder in ongoing hyper responder your antral follicle count is good but the rate of follicular growth is not coming up to the way you want and your estrogen levels are not going up to the rate, to the rate you want and in these patients the common uh, thing that is there done is the fsh dose is increased but if you are given adequate dose of fsh based on the age bmi and antral follicle count then in these patients if you add 75 units of lh they respond the so the ongoing hyper responder are uh, patients whom on the day 5 or day 6 or day 8 you see the antral follicles are visibly seen but the rate of growth is less and the e2 level is low and in these patients adding lh will solve the role of L, of the hyper responder and a yield a good yield of oocytes the recommendations of this paper were to use the lh supplementation in this way and if it is a previous history with a similar response then start lh supplementation from day 1 but there are certain uh, reservations that this paper also had said was further research for patients at risk of poor ovarian response based on antral follicle count of less than 
AMH less than 1.5 need further action and this was addressed by the Poseidon group 2 and 4 in the subsequent years of 2016. And the third area is the alleged polymorphism and we were fortunate enough to work on that project. So the carry home message of this article is if you have a simulation cycle on day 5 or day 6, you have given adequate dose of FSH and they are not responding but you are able to see the follicles. Don't raise the FSH, add 75 units of LH and the response will come. These are the hyperresponder patients and these are different from who responders. One of the key thing one should remember in the role of LH in stimulation protocol is they should make a difference between a poor responder and a hyper responder. A hyper responder can be corrected by LH supplementation. A poor responder can't be corrected by LH supplementation. There your numbers are low and whatever you do, the things should stand the same thing. When you look at the pharmacogenomics of LH and LHCGR, we, we try to I mean, uh, mistake, I mean, confuse between an LH gene and LH receptor gene. In an LH gene, most of the problems produce inactivating muta mutations and they are more associated with sterility and they are less common compared to LH receptor gene. So in a clinical practice, the number of times you find an LH gene abnormality in a reproductive medicine is very, very less. Whereas in LH receptor problem, the inactivating mutations are less, their polymorphisms are very common, they are close to 520 polymorphisms, of which three polymorphisms are important in day-to-day -day practice. The three polymorphisms that are important in day-to-day -day practice is at the exon 1, a 6 base pair insertion, at the 291 position in the LH gene on exon 10, there is a change in amino acid that's called to, uh, that has a particular name called RS1247062. Then you have the another gene which is the 312 serine to asparagine change. In the Indian subgroup, we have found except for one patient, all the patients did not have any 291 polymorphisms. The common polymorphisms we have seen is the exon 10, 312, serine to asparagine area and to a certain extent the 18 exon 1 also known as 6 base pair insertion are the commonest things we see. Even though they are 520, these are the three common things world over and mostly in India and from the Italian studies, these 312 uh, serine asparagine and uh, exon 1 6 bed insertion of the common polymorphism that are seen which affect the reproductive outcome. I am glad and I am proud to present uh, Robert Fisher's slide of last year in which he suggested two single nucleotide polymorphism receptors are sensitive to exogenous gondotropins. The first is the 2N91, which I described earlier. The second is the 312 serine. And he has put this slide of our paper, so suggesting the importance of our work. And I'm proud to be an Indian and to contribute to the global level. How did we attribute LH polymorphism to LH supplementation? After the PC Wong article, which I described in the second or third slide, we found that hyper responders needed LH supplementation and then we started adding 37 units for younger patients and 75 units for more than 35 years but later modified it into 75 units for all these patients of hyper responder. Subsequently what we did was <coughs> we acquired a gene sequencer in 2011 and able to do a gene sequence this is called an electrophorogram how we, in which an LH CGR 312 is seen here, an A by G is seen here and a G by G. This is how the report comes in. 
for every patient we did an ivf cycle between 2001 2011 and 14 we collected the blood samples extracted the dna and kept it aside and after completing the cycles we analyzed the, G- the dna pattern and then correlated with their outcomes so in the analysis what we looked at is in relation to the to the type of polymorphism we calculated the lh dosage and the lh supplementation in different genotypes and what we found was in gyg there was a significant need as as 90% of the people needed lh supplementation in abg of 312 90% required and in aba 70% required when we did a further analysis the amount of lh needed for a by a was very less and more so it was used it was needed only in the older patients whereas in a by g and g by g both younger and older people needed lh supplementation when we further studied them in 312 a by a these people needed less amount of lh supplementation and they had androgen excess and in subsequent cycles we have completely stopped adding lh supplementation which will explain in a moment in 312 g by g they had higher number of previous cycles who are poor responders most of the people with 312 g by g will have a regular cycle or a shorter cycle by couple of days showing an increase slightly fsh and lh ratio alteration in conclusion what we found was we found a consistent association between lh receptor polymorphism and a higher requirement for lh supplementation in homozygous and heterozygous for serine with a significant increase in the clinical pa- pregnancy rate so the conclusions of our study was a candidate gene approach may help to predetermine that these predictors can be used to use the lh supplementation the concept is as follows this is called the a by a that means asparagine is a, is the is the wild type and there is the lh goes inside freely and there is no need for lh supplementation in a by g you have asparagine serine some amount of reduction in the soluble lh is there and in serine serine g by g there is there is a less amount of available lh so in turn these are the people which will need lh supplementation when you look at much more deeply in 312 a by a where there is no need of lh supplementation the cyclical amp production and the androgen production in this uh, receptor is perfect and there is no need for lh supplementation and in this woman if you give fsh only it is adequate when you look at g by g there is impaired signaling and less amount of cyclical amp and androgen production is there so the need for lh supplementation is there so this is the molecular basis for lh supplementation in a by a in 312 and g by g in uh, in 312 following this work we have we have just submitted a, a paper on this work wherein we moved into not giving any lh for an a by a then we started giving thetson units for a by g and we have started giving san5 units for g by g and we found the results are satisfactory the 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 key message in this study was lh receptor has an important pharmacogenic role in the responders more studies are needed and understanding the the integration of fsh and lh cgr is the future but before i say the end of this lecture in a day to day practice when one does not have an lh receptor gene they can base the study on their ongoing hyper responder concept and also a woman with a g by g will always have a regular cycles and their 
we are having difficulty in breaking the regulation from monocycular development to multifollicular development. If LH receptor is available, if the report says G by G is there, that means the asparagin is, is replaced and serine is there, there, then you have to give sanfa units right from the beginning. If it is a heterozygous, we give right from the beginning, but we give touchdown units. And when it is wild type A by A, we don't give any LS at all. Uh, one important good news that is coming in was uh, in another couple of years, couple of companies are trying to identify a pregnancy based card which will have three parameters containing LHCGR312 with different lines. And if you put a drop of blood, it identifies that thing and give you a bedside tool where you don't need the whole gene sequence to identify it. But it will take two to two and a half years to come in. The carry home message of this thing is one should understand there is no role for LH in poor responder. And second thing is a hyper responder does not need USA donation. If it is in the current cycle, you can add LH supplementation. And if you have the privilege of having the LH receptors, then you can plan the cycle of LH supplementation right from the day one so that your follicle to oocyte output and your hyper poor responders and your hyper stimulations are significantly reduced. Um. Thank you very much, sir. I think that's been very enlightening, actually. Um, Can you stop I, sharing the screen, sir? Yeah. Devika, uh -huh. I'll go with the questions which are there in the PowerPoint. So yeah, could you sure. please go through the questions which has come in the chat box? Okay. So I'll take up these questions and then you please see what questions have come in the chat box. Uh, why should we offer polymorphism? Uh, the answer is very simple. If you have a sophisticated tool which will avoid a failure of a cycle and it will give you optimum oocyte and uh, it's like this, it's a precision tool which will make you stimulate the ovary in the right way and offer adequate follicle to oocyte output rate ratio and in turn a better pregnancy rate is the reason to do polymorphism. The second thing is uh, instead of wasting a cycle of testing and then failing, you use a polymorphism to decide who needs LA supplementation and then get a better outcome. So, so the question is like, you know, we are, we are asking, sir, which patient should we offer polymorphism? Definitely. We know it's a wonderful tool. If I understand that and we can give to the patient, but which patients, how do I decide? Do I do for all ART patients or from select group of patients? How do I select which patients I'm going to test? Once cover sheet is test come in, my answer is to every patient. Uh, we'll go at the chat and... Okay. 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 Uh, my, my answer is to every patient because what happens is uh, it makes our treatment more efficient. Okay. At this stage, or we want to do a few more studies have to come or we need to understand our population or like, do you think right now we are ready to take up the safe as a polymorphism test sir, for all patients? To be honest, uh, there are only few groups. One is from the Italy who has done the work on LS polymorphism. And, and our group, and now uh, Carla Luigi and Sandros are trying to do a multinational study using the LH receptor to find, to use it in a double blind study. That will give us a valid our information. And uh, the, the answer is like this. We found FSH receptors are not so important as LH receptors in terms of follicle to oocyte output. Okay. Uh, the only, uh, only extra information I get from FSHR is in FSHR 6 by 80, if I have a A by A, 
that is serene serene there by number of oocytes will come down but it will not be useful to improve the outcome even though we do fshr and lshcg receptors we found only the 312 receptor is the most useful in improving the outcome or in improving the manipulation then regarding the estrogen receptors and ama amh receptors i don't have any experience at all because i didn't do any work on that okay so so now you are telling that we can only ask for an lhcgr receptor testing so there is no need to ask for an fsh receptor testing yes the answer is yes for the next okay. two years okay okay is there any epidemiological studies done in the normal fertile woman to see for polymorphism each test is a bomb so doing it for a epidemiological studies if somebody sends me normal fertile fertile woman woman who have conceived spontaneously and if they are able to send me 300 such fertile women i am willing to cooperate with that couple with that group okay so how much does it cost sir then your bomb <laughs> uh 10000 rupees oh my god okay each, each is 6000 6000 yeah 10000 right 6000 Those are charging a six thousand. I mean, like what we do is we do uh, FSH R six eighty, eight not seven twenty nine. We also do exon one two nine two one at the tenth pair and the three twelve. Totally six sets of genes. Man, uh, six sets of genes are there. But whatever said and done, it's not cheap. Yeah, it's not cheap. Yes. And uh, is there any th evidence to suggest the testing for polymorphism in hyper responders? Yes. If, if you have a three twelve A by A and a and a FSH six by A six by A six eighty G by G, then the risk of hyper stimulation is very high. so we can find out by testing it can be done yes okay uh, okay can i please ask one question in between is that okay yeah, yeah. have you used these tests uh, on your own patients in the sense of apart from apart from uh, or outside the research context have you uh, you know used it and then try to kind of uh, modify your stimulation protocol or something uh one thing is people think mark supported me the answer is no mm -hmm. every paisa we paid for 3000 tests is the clinic subsidized it oh god okay yeah and the, whatever i am talking is which from 2900 tests mm -hmm. and for 2400 400 tests we did not charge anything only after the publication of the paper we started charging 10000 rupees Right. Okay. And this is blood. You take blood or what? Blood. Blood only. Oh. Yeah. Even the buccal mucosa can be taken, but uh, Indian women don't feel comfortable with buccal mucosa. Okay. Okay. So this is same. I think you already answered this question. We can find out by testing whether the patient is having hyper response or poor response. Yes. That one is. Does FSH or polymorphism explain resistant PCOS? Any studies have been done regarding the same? One thing is, I never faced anybody with resistant PCOS. You have never seen a case with resistant PCOS. You have not seen. Tell me what is resistant PCOS? Doesn't respond to your dose of PC. Uh, you know your uh, gonadotrophins. you give 150 generally in pcos you say that you know you want to start with 150 or 225 she just doesn't respond and you increase you give on gone giving she doesn't respond so you are telling and uh, what do we do for such a patient i mean i would like to look at the testosterone levels okay i would like to look at the insulin levels okay and i would like to also look at the cl clinical pro profile of the distribution of the follicles whether i'm having uh, 30 follicles or not Hmm. And then I would put them on metformin. Okay. Reduce my testosterone. 
and then simulate them. Drilling, you would want to do? The answer is no. It's not done. No. 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 The only exception is uh, when the testosterone is elevated, uh, I mean uh, beyond seventy-five and uh, beyond beyond hundred. I would also like to look at seventeen hydroxy progesterone and the DHEA. There, I might add uh, the I mean uh, dexamethasone and reduce the uh, those levels before I start the simulation. Okay. Any studies have been done, sir, on this PCOS and polymorphism? I mean, the PCOS and polymorphism are studied. Uh, but what happens is the PCO does not fall into the same group. Sometimes you also see PCO in the G by G group. Can the results of polymorphism of FSH and LH receptors in the leukocytes, that is peripheral blood, what we see, be extrapolated to polymorphism in the granulosa cell? The answer is yes. Okay. Because we. Do. The the blood. Uh, I mean, the, we are looking at gene polymorphism. Okay. The gene polymorphism is everywhere in the body. The answer is yes for this. Okay. Okay. Now this is a this is a practical question we are going to ask you, sir. We want you to tell us, like, not in the research context, uh, context in the clinical practice context. So, how do we counsel the patients before testing? How do we interpret the results? How should be our what should be our post? counseling so i'm going to put a mock uh, report to you so we want you to tell before asking for a test in a woman what do you counsel her no no i mean uh, to be uh, to be honest after the after a publication okay we tell them you have to do this test we don't give any choice or oh, no choice because they know you're done a research they may say yes suppose i have to do What do I tell the patient? He will ask me why am I doing this test? No, no. What happens is you should have a standard protocol and say this is the protocol I follow. Okay, okay. So you are you are making it as almost like a sort of a part of the protocol. Yeah, since 2011, we did it for every patient that we had an IVF. Okay. And we stored all the DNA for further valid valid validation by anybody in the world. Okay. 2019, we started charging it because we didn't want to charge, even though we understood the concept. With the publication, I am clear that my data is validated by the peer reviews, and my paper was rejected twelve times. Oh my God! Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. I don't blame them because the peer reviewer. Should be not biased against LH. The peer reviewer should be good in simulation protocol. The peer reviewer should understand pharmacogenomics. The peer reviewer should be good in LH receptor and FSH receptor. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, they will say your publication is good, but it will not fit your journal. You can try elsewhere. So the last one on the list is. Sorry, proceed. Uh-huh. Coming from India, where they have their own skepticism about Indian work. Mm. Okay. <laughs> so this. Uh, 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 but Shobhana, to answer that, to to just uh, kind of say, I don't. I mean, you should actually maybe. Should, I do not know, Dr. Uh, Ramraju can actually throw some light on this. Maybe it should be ad- advocated for patients who have. Not responded the way you expected them to respond, right? I mean, so it's a normal gonadotropic hyporesponder. So you everything that you see is normal, but then when you actually give her the medication, nothing happens. So maybe those are the ones that you actually have to suggest a, a LH polymorphism, LH receptor polymorphism uh, test for. I think. Uh, like uh, if you are seeing adequate antifollicles and you get did not get the follicles that you. Follicle to oocyte output, yeah. and the first criteria which need LH polymorphism. Yeah, maybe those are the kinds of people. Uh, but basically, hyper responders you are telling. Normal gonadotropic. 
Yeah, normal gonadotropic hyporesponders. Yeah, hyporesponders in the previous cycle. Present cycle also, if she has, if she is not responding, you can. Uh, but you have to go send the blood and take the test, get the test uh -huh. report, and then come. Yeah, and but then testing has to be done. Yeah, testing has to be done, uh, next cycle, right? Correct. Okay. So this is a mock uh, um, report of one of the patient. So we want you to tell us how do we interpret this test. So this was a patient who, who was sent for LHCGR and FSHR gene polymorphism screening in view of secondary infertility. She has a history of IU and IVF failure. Therefore, she's been tested for five commonly reported polymorphism in the above mentioned genes. This was the report. What is the interpretation of this report, sir? And what do you tell the patient? Uh, here, what I would look at is as follows. Uh, most of the time, in this patient, if your tubes are normal, then she might have a male factor rather than a, rather than a ovarian factor. So what is the interpretation of this? Sir, let me, let us confess to you that, you know, we have not been trained in the genetics, neither in undergraduates or graduates. And we are, we are, this is like, you know, it is, uh, it is tongue twisting for us even to say all those words and that variant, if you see it, you will develop a mind block. Look, it is so complex. Can you simplify and tell us like, okay, you see this, if this is like this, this is what you have to do. Is it anything simplified way? Can we understand this? Yes. Uh, exon 1 does not have implication on the stimulation protocol. That means LSCJ or exon 1. Okay. But these people should be warned after reading the literature that that group of patients in future have a higher risk of breast cancer. Oh. Oh. Well, in exon 1, the second report is LHCG at exon 10, homozygous, G by G. It was LH. Okay. In this patient, most of the time, you will have regular menstrual cycles. Okay. And uh, her acne level is will be very low. Hmm. And uh, her body hair will be low. Then when you look, go into... FSHR 29G by A, I won't bother about that report. FSHR 307, uh, I won't bother about the report. FSHR 680, heterozygous, does not have negative or positive implications. Okay. So in so this... 3112 is important. Uh, in, like if, it's not 10312. If the FSHR 680, that's the last report, okay. is A by A, I expect poor responder. Okay. Okay. So now uh, this, is a, this is a report they have given. This is a variant interpretation they had given in this report. They said it is most likely to experience IVF failure as, or has low chance of achieving IVF success. So they have a disclaimer. Disclaimer telling that it, it, all this polymorphism can work along with uh, estrogen receptors um, uh, polymorphism and ovarian response. And this data is not for Indian ethnicity. This indicates only the prediction and not diagnostic of a condition. I mean, I would challenge them to get them pregnant. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so uh, I think in the second line it was G by G. No. So according to whatever you have said, we must add on LH in that, right? Yes. Yeah, and, um, and and in heterozygous, the last line is is really not uh, significant. So only if it is homozygous, then you have to again add a huh? Is there, is it something like that? No, in a, if the FSHR, the last line six eighty A by A is there. Uh, not G by A. No, no. If we, if it is not G by A, but A by A. Ah, uh, okay. She's normal. No, no. She will need higher dose of FSH. Oh, okay, fine. Okay. Because uh, there is a lot of data showing uh, 680 A by A needs higher dose compared to other groups of patients. Okay, fine. 
Okay. Yeah. So yeah, understood that. Um. Okay. Hmm. Now after this, uh, they give that uh, report like you know they tell the what is the genotype, what will be the phenotype. In the report says if this is a genotype, this is going to the phenotype. That is acceptable. I mean, we can uh, we can analyze it, you know, interpret like that. No, no. What you should understand is hmm. for amino acid asparagin. Okay. The abbreviation is asparagin. The abbreviation is ASN. The abbreviation is A. Hmm. Yeah, that's my next question. Actually, I put up that question. And uh, for uh, serine, the abbreviation is uh, serine. The second is uh, SCR, and the third is N is the serine. N is the serine here. Okay. So there, these people have confused. Yeah. I mean, A by A is asparagin and asparagin. N by A, N by N is serine, serine. G by G is the base pair that you have replaced for for A T to G C. You have replaced G G. So we are confused between the base pairs yeah. and the. Yeah. the amino acid so now i put up this slide and most of the literature when you look at polymorphism they have some books have given this serine and a baji some book have given the genotype some book and some publications have given variant so, so the, how is the right way to remember this you must remember a by a g by g that's the right way of remembering them no no Ser serine has three abbreviations one is okay. serine the second is scr okay Uh, the third is N. What is G? Because uh, G, G, G basically they have confused the structure. Here instead of writing the amino acid change, they have they have written the base pair change. This is all in the published literature, which have been published on polymorphism. Uh, they have given like that. Sir, I was wondering international consensus on how a reporting has to be done. That true, but the author can make a mistake, no? <laughs> okay. Shobhana, <laughs> you and I need to go for a first genetics class. <laughs> no, I think most of us have to go, Devika. Yeah. But, and it is very easy to say that we will do the testing, but then the exactly, exactly to understand. It. Ah, so, the testing. I may send it to Dr. Ram Raju for uh, interpretation, and then he can send it back. <laughs> What happens is it's not so complex. No, it's not so complex. But what we what people make complex is not uniform. Uni, using the uniform lettering code to describe it. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, second thing is they're confusing people hmm. uh, by in the same article. Somewhere they write serine, somewhere exactly. they write yeah, somewhere they write uh, yeah. yes, yes, in the same article. Yes, precisely that is what they have done. I mean, on our own article, we made that mistake. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, we didn't have so much of thorough control on the thing. Okay. okay. So at different points, we wrote serine, SCR, and N. Technically, they are right. But we did not use uniform nomenclature, and never explained in the in the appendix that this is what is the meaning. Okay, right. So next question, we'll move on to the next clinical question. What are the markers for addition of LH supplementation in COS, and do you test for LH during your stimulation protocol? Uh, the second question is during stimulation protocol, I don't test the LH. Because I don't find the need for testing LH because I don't think it add any value. And also, the bioactive LH may not be equivalent to the amount of LH that you actually measure. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Second thing is uh, the markers for addition of LH supplementation is the hyperresponder. Okay. That means you see follicles, but the rate of follicular growth is less. It correlates with your with your estrogen levels. Another uh, 
thing which I do is when I'm doing a stimulation, I also look at cervical secretions. If we are looking at cervical secretions and they are progressing well, the estrogen levels are fine. Uh, uh, I would like to add, how do I start a simulation protocol dosage? Uh, I take a base value of 200 units, which is an arbitrary FSH. Then uh, I take the BMI 25 as arbitrary units. If the BMI is less than 25, uh, I minus 25 units. The BMI is 30, I add plus the 25 units. The BMI is 35, I add plus 50 units. Similarly, I add age. If the age is 30 years, 28 to 30 years, my basal level FSH is 200. If it's 25, I minus 25 units. If it's 20, I minus 50 units. If it is 35, I add 25 units. Then I, I take the uh, AMH or antral follicle count, only one of them. If the antral follicle count is 8 to 14, I put it as 200 units. If it's more than 14 to 20, I minus 25 units. If it's less than 8, I add another 25 units. And if it's more than 25, I minus another 25 units. More than 30, I minus another 25 units. Okay. This, this we have to have. <laughs> 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 the end works and uh, also look at endometriosis if the patient had endometriotic surgery and an inflation of the endometrium add 25 units if somebody does uh, wear in drilling for a regular cycle woman add 25 units oh okay and uh, if there is an extensive endomyosis or a myomectomy which is larger, which might alter the blood flow, I add 25 units. But one thing is, even though I join together, and uh, even though it comes beyond 300 units, I don't give beyond 300 units. I give only 300 units. Okay. So based on the patient profile, you keep changing. Okay. But, but uh, even though the value comes, 400 units, I don't give 400 units, I only give 300 units. Thanks. Okay. And I give FSH. But sometimes what happens is, your uh, in PCOD, who has excess responder, your FSH dose can come as low as 50 or 75 units. Okay. And then I write how many oocytes I'm going to get, then correlate it after the aggregator whether I got that number or not, which I audit every time. So, uh, you predict the number of oocytes when you actually start? Uh, I might have 30 oocytes, but when I do this protocol, I say this is the number I want. That is that is when you predict it, sir? On the day one. The day one. Oh! And then uh, your ego takes a hit when you get 25. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> time, what happens is you fine tune your simulation because in the PCOD you find two sets of follicles, very small follicles and slightly bigger than that follicles. Okay. okay. Uh, and I don't change my dosage in between. Uh, uh, at the most, I change my dosage once. But the number of times I change my dosage is less than 10%. Uh, I have a question here uh, because I, I do know that you use a lot of down regulation uh, protocols for your, uh, I mean, down regulation for your stimulation. Is that correct or has no, that changed? No, because people are commenting. I also gained experience in Antigua. Okay. <laughs> okay, fine. But then if you start uh, for, for a PCO who's got a high AMH, high antifoil account, if you start at 75, uh, so, and you don't change it for a long time, then your uh, stimulation protocol is going to go on and on and on. Because I have given to importance to age. 
Oh, it all that minus and plus. Oh, minus. Ah, ha, ha. Okay. Then I've given it to the BMI. Yeah, yeah, all that also. But then the thing is that if you're only going to start at seventy-five, I mean, it's going to go on forever. No, no. I mean, uh, very few people. Where uh, if the BMI, if the, if the woman is obese, if the PC, you okay. don't get it at seventy-five. Yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. So you do all the calculations, the minus and the plus ones. Okay. Okay. So I think from the from our reserved questions, this is the last question. Do you think the future is pharmacogenomic approach to standardize the treatment protocol for in ERT? So we know this pharmacogenomic approach is already uh, used in cardiology and neurology and all that. So do you think that subsequently we will start doing along with AMI, AFC, AGE, BMI and all that one polymorphism test, sir? Do you think the future is going to be like that? In four to five years, the answer is hundred percent yes. I can give it in writing. Oh. Okay. <laughs> uh, I have one question, one last question. So, now if you uh, you want to ask anything more, maybe because we have some questions in the chat box. So after this question, we'll go to the chat box. Okay. I want you to take up the questions in the chat box. I don't. I can't see those questions though. Can't see. Nivedita, can you see? No, I can see the option, but all the questions are not there. Yeah, questions are not there. The chat is open, but I don't see the questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any questions are there? Okay. Yeah. Let me just check it. Okay, you are asking something, Devika. Please go ahead. Um, the questions are only sent to Dr. Shobana. Okay, fine. That's only you have the question, Shobana. Okay. So one very quick question. There was one uh, uh, company from Hyderabad which actually approached me, saying that you know, uh, you can if if you have patients with uh, recurrent implantation failure or recurrent failed IVFs, then um, um, then the, then then would you want to? I mean, you could send them uh, the patients, but the husband and the wife's blood, uh, looking at the various parameters, and they would give you an answer as to uh, not how to do the stimulation protocol, but then whether to use their own oocytes, you know, or or own uh, a sperm. And this is one company that has been pushing it even for recurrent miscarriage. So, do you believe in things like that? The answer is no. Why? The reason is, first of all, is uh, we should look at product of conception before we say it's an aneuploid or euploid pregnancy. Yeah, but just because you have a product of conception which is uh, aneuploid for the first time, does not mean that she is again going to be aneuploid the next time, no? Then, uh, what are they looking at in the oocytes and the sperm? They're doing some kind of a G DNA analysis. I do not know uh, for, for various sperm parameters and things. Oh, we have so many questions. Okay, so I'll, I'll give you a call and ask if I have a problem with that. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, Devika, yeah. quickly we will uh, we have to take our questions quickly. Yeah. So, Question number fourteen. You start with question number fourteen. Yeah. Fourteen uh, is um, okay. Aparna. Yeah, from Dr. Aparna Sunil in Kochi. Uh, so similarly, FSH polymorphism can be used to adjust both the FSH dose and the LH, LH addition, as some uh, FSH polymorphisms are prone for OHSS. Is that correct? No. Actually, what happens is, what are the publications come in in FSH six eighty? So here the A, there are many papers to show they need large amount of stimulation. But it, when it comes to FSHR 680 G by G, there are only one or two publications showing they hyper respond. So in terms of evidence that is there, FSHR 680 A by A needs larger stimulation to get more adequate number of oocytes, but not more number of oocytes. Okay. So the answer is in between. Okay. Now uh, again, same upper national from Kochi says, uh, is there a role of FSH and LH polymorphism in male infertility? There are a couple of papers are there, but we didn't work anything on that. So the answer is my knowledge is zero. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ramesh P from again Kochi, uh, any harm in giving LH for A by A? Uh, We found the pregnancy rates did, make, did not make a difference, but the carry home baby rate made a difference. So it was lower or higher or what? 
where you simply be given a leash for the ABA. The pregnancy rates were same, and the carry home baby rates were lower. You added LH. Yes. Subsequently, we stopped it, but it's because the carry home baby rate is ultimate criteria. I see. Yeah. There were more miscarriages, is it? I mean, there were more miscarriages because LH was added to ABA. How did the carry home baby rate go down? We, we we didn't have an explanation, but uh, uh, one of the study we did was, which we just submitted for publication was, we had 118 patients who had IVF cycle with us in 2000 between 2007 and and 11, and then they came back between 2014 to 18. They were 118 patients, and in these patients, that means they are the self-control group. When we use the polymorphism, the in this group, uh, after removing LH from the A by A, it had a significant pregnancy rate and carry home baby rate. And in the G by G, whom we added LH, which we did not add in the first cycle, the carry home baby rate was mind-boggling, close to 46 percent. And these are the patients who came back after five years after the first cycle. Okay, uh, Mr. Sri Garan uh, Karthikeyan from Chennai. We all know HMGs are being spiked by HCG for LH activity. Do we have a test or analysis available here to identify the content of HCG spiked in each of these HMG brands and possibility of identifying the sources of these spiked HCGs? What you can do is you can dilute it and then do a serum HCG level. You get the values. Oh. Okay. Or we can put a on a pregnancy test to verify first of all whether HCG is added on a pregnancy test kit. Get the positive. Then you, you use it a dilution factor and estimate how you do the HCG estimation. But whether you have to use saline or distilled water, I'm not sure, but I remember it's saline. Okay, Swetha Jain from Ghaziabad. Uh, in absence of LH polymorphism testing, how can we make use of LH supplementation in our protocols? The answer is very simple. If you have a hyper responder and uh, you are seeing follicles, do an adequate FSH dosage, and then add seven five units of LH. That's the most easiest, convenient, and cost-effective method. Okay. Okay. The same question, I think. Uh, Repeat it again. Yeah. So want to get that question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, next question is by uh, Dr. Rita Billiandi from Bengaluru. Uh, Hyper responders are helped by LH supplementation, whereas poor responders are not. But studies have shown benefits in older women. Uh, actually, what happens is uh, when they looked at older women, that study was independent of hyper responders. Uh-huh. And uh, they they did not rule hyper responders in the older women group to say LH supplementation benefits. There was only groups of people saying the number of receptors decrease on the granular cell, so you need LH supplementation, which has been seldom proved at the at the I mean uh, uh, immunohistochemistry level. Okay, Dr. Shashi Rekha from Chennai. Can we give simple HMG instead of LH if affordability is a concern? For an young woman, anything is fine. For a young woman with less than 30 years, any medication is fine. But as the age goes, as the comorbidity increases, using a purer preparation makes a difference. Okay. So, uh, so question 22, I think, is the same thing. No, we have another 20 questions. Okay. <laughs> so quickly, we must take yes, no, yes, no, yes. We should do yes like that. Okay, Doctor Rita Billiandi uh, from Bengaluru. Are there different types of hyperresponders based on their LH receptor gene composition? Uh, like uh, in a G by G, very few times you get hyperresponder. Um, unless you give more FSH doses than what is required, in A by A they tend to hyper respond. But one thing is, I want all of you to 
accept one thing is use one product of hmg and use one product of fsh and try to ask the supplier to give the same batch of medication and tell you when they change the batch it makes a huge difference every yeah, we... second thing is look at your cold chain management and look at your fridge whether it's cold over cold or at the appropriate temperature as described by the manufacturers these are the two areas which make a huge difference in the stimulation protocol and the third thing is never take the stock from the representative never bring the stock on from the representative from the representative okay always get it from the stockist yeah actually so you can also ask for a data log no uh, regarding the temperature but the younger people will not be knowing that no? and asking the data logger is the best thing mm -hmm. but for, uh, for the newcomers uh, uh when uh, they are the I men uh, from the stock expense it's implied that the stock is will take precautions and uh, second thing is be aware if you are using hmg try to use a single batch for a single cycle so that your stimulation is uniform that makes a lot of difference Dr. Aradhya A from Hyderabad. If we see there is less response, can we still add R L H on recombinant L H on day seven or day? Eight? Will it help in improving the response? Uh, if your antigen follicle count is good and your starting dose of F S H is adequate, based on the, your your algorithms either by Shesh Shankara where she had uh, the lines of the adequate dosage H A M H and A F C. If you follow that uh, thing. Actually, uh, in one of our uh, human reproduction paper, she wrote about a diagram showing the amount of FSH that should be the starting dosage. If you use that, then adding LH makes a sense. If you are given uh, suboptimal dosages and then add LH, it doesn't work. Okay. Uh, in, uh, in antagonist cycles, is the role of LH supplementation the same as in agonist cycles? Because in these, the basal LH levels are usually okay. I think the answer is the same, right? You can you already answered it. Is the LH supplementation uh, role is the same in agonist and antagonist cycles? It's the same because there's new data coming in that the fall of LH happens from the sixth day to ninth day. But the relative fall in relation to agonistic cycle is different. But the fall happens. So you can use it in the same way. Okay. okay. Can you please opine regarding the impact of estrogen receptor polymorphism on endometrial receptivity? And all is zero in that area. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dr. Mona from Chennai, sir, in patients with LH gene polymorphism, will day two estradiol levels be lower, particularly in PCO patients? Uh, if you are if you are looking at antagon protocol, and if your withdrawal bleeding is from madroxyprolistin estate, your E2 levels might be lower. And if you are giving a pill for longer duration, your E2 level on day two will be lower in a PCO cycle. No, she's asking in relation to LH gene polymorphism. Because so what happens is when this variable is there, I don't think that will make a difference. Okay, sir. And uh, using a pill for two cycles and then looking at the E2 and the day two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, from Vizak, Monica uh, Ravuri. Uh, E2 on day nine of stimulation was seven thousand uh, picograms. PCO AMH is three point two. Mm -hmm. So she retrieved 9M2 and 11M1 oocytes. Do you think this is a there is a polymorphism in this case? Uh, here there is a mismatch between the number of oocytes retrieved and the E2 levels. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? Yeah, she finally got um, what 20 oocytes, out of which only 9 were M2. Uh, maybe it's seven thousand. Yeah, very high. Yeah, and there's also mismatch between uh, 
that and her AMS because at a three point two, I don't know if you'll you know if she'll actually get a nice seven thousand. I do not know. And uh, man, uh, she must be looking at she must recount her annual follicle count in a better way. Hmm. And uh, using the Sinilook method, if she does not have Sony ABC, and then count it carefully, because sometimes people tend to count only the ten millimeter follicles. They don't count the four millimeter follicles. Yeah. Maybe that's where they make the mistake. Okay, Dr. Padmaja Veera Machaneni from Vijayawada. One group of PCOs have very small follicles, anterior follicles, uh, two to four millimeters, hypothecosis, volume of approximately 15 ml and 40 follicles. What should she do? 50 follicles. What should you do? Means like, uh, I mean, I, I would prefer to do a testosterone level. Reduce the testosterone. No, that we do not know. She's not told. I think there is the president of East Andhra Pradesh Offshoots and Gynec Society. <laughs> uh, uh, but basically, unless I have the data, yeah, I can't touch it. Yeah. Uh, Doctor, we have quite a few, sir. Yeah, quite a few, sir. Another five we will take. Uh, another five we will take. Yeah. Okay, Doctor Santosh Gupta. To avoid such an expensive test, can we add twenty-five? Are you alleged to all IVF stimulation? Santosh Gupta from Bangalore. Uh, the cost of alleged is around 2500 per day. Mm. And uh, you are giving it for 10 to 12 days. Compared to the cost of the test. Mm. So one thing is, uh, there is a misconception about low cost IVF. Mm. Low cost IVF optimizing the cost without compromising the result and avoiding unnecessary evidence no evidence based products to be used during the cycle and minimizing the test where you have strong evidence is low cost IVF as per me low cost IVF is not uh, doing the right thing that's how I look at it. So that means you're saying you don't believe in low cost IVF. Believe it, but not at the cost of the pre IVF workup. Not at the cost of pre IVF workup. Ah. Okay. Uh, what happens is most of the time low cost IVF people say, but don't do the male workup. Oh. Hmm. Okay. So is it justified? Hmm. Okay. Um, should we go to the next question? Uh, Rita Bajangi from Bangalore. Uh, Devika, just check there. That's it. These questions have been taken up. I think we move down. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, hypo responders, I think 23rd Rita, which uh, the question has been asked already answered. Huh? I think 34 you can take up. Okay, Dr. Gita from Professor, what will be the starting dose for 34 years? PCO, AMH9, BMI 33, AFC 90. You must get a calculator. <laughs> 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 so, this is, you're going to answer this, sir? This is a 34 year old. So that's minus, that's plus 25 thing. Then AMH is 9. Questions, are not, questions have been repeated. Okay, and I think I'm just happy to tell you that we have more than 532 delegates, uh, you know, who are listening to him. That's a huge, huge number. Congratulations, sir. And I think yeah, we'll take the last, I think last question we will take. I think the most of the questions I think we have uh, already answered. I think, one one. I think 40 and 41. Can you take up those questions? Uh, Devika? Okay, Vijay Honavar from Hubli in India. Um, what is the question? In many in India, many IVF centers use uh, HMG. No, next, next okay. 41. 
In many cycles, HMG HMG is used for all patients. Is it harmful to the patient who does not need? If you do polymorphism, uh, polymorphism comes for the role of allied supplementation. When you're using a HMG cycle, I don't think uh, polymorphism has a role. The reason is already you're giving allied supplementation. You are also giving HCG supplementation and a HMB and a FSA supplementation. So uh, there, I don't think there is a role for polymorphism because polymorphism is to fine tune your stimulation. Okay, sir. Uh, just one. In, uh, I think we have come to the end of our, our questions. And like Dr. Rita said, congratulations. You know, it's been a real successful uh, program, and uh, you know. Uh, that a lot of credit goes to your huge reputation as a pioneer, as a, also as an academician, and uh, and uh, you know you do excellent work. And also, ultimately, did I share the knowledge? That's the bottom line. Yes, I'm sure you did. But just a few uh, because I think a lot of people are asking about polymorphism. Just a few. Practical points. I mean, because polymorphism right now may not be available to everybody in the commercial sense. So, just a few, uh, two, three takeaway points on this lecture. Now, uh, what happens is, I would prefer to have the questions and then write a white paper on that, right. because that makes more sense. Okay. One yeah. takeaway point. One takeaway point is, if they're able to use hyperresponder optimally, there's no need to use. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Define your own starting dosage in a rational way, and keep on looking at the follicle to oocyte ratio. A combination of these two things will not create polymorphism to a large number of people. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> People, look, people don't do this and expect polymorphism to solve the problems. Mm. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and also, you do think that the genetics is the way forward. Genetics is the way forward, but uh, but but there are much simpler answers. Yes. You, you should you should be very clear about your how you are doing the starting dosage. You should be using one single product, which are the companies. Look at your cold chain management. And then use hyper responder as an allay supplementation. Then doing a polymorphism test is not needed. Yes, sir. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, last words from you, uh, from you, Shobana. I, I request Nivedita to uh, propose a vote of thanks, and I definitely want to congratulate Ramaj Raju sir. And I am very happy that you know we have so many uh, viewers, and then we have done a, such a fantastic job almost. Two hours, I think, more than two. Uh, nearing two hours, we have discussed this two topics, and uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. I'm Vedita, can you like please vote of thanks? I'm very happy for the Karnataka ISAR Society for allowing me to share the knowledge, which very few societies have did it. So we are different, sir. We are different. We are meeting for you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> we are different. <laughs> very happy and proud. Thank you. <laughs> now I shall be concluding the session. It's a futuristic session. I think the word would fit as futuristic. The topics were all futuristic. Our talk was futuristic. I think uh, we must appreciate the time and effort spared for the chapter, Karnataka chapter. Thank you so much, sir. I've also got to thank Mark Sereno for supporting us in this endeavor. And the names that I need a special mention are Mr. Rajendra Mohan, who's the national sales manager, and Mr. Vijay Raghavan. The regional business manager, Mr. Sesha and Mr. Subu have helped us with the web platform, and they've organized it so smoothly. We didn't have any disruption. Brilliant! I thought that they did a great job. Our esteemed audience, their participation, 532 is a brilliant number, and that inspires us to conduct more such sessions. I'm sure the delegates have all gained practical insight, and they'll have some changes to apply in their clinical practice. I. Also, want to conclude uh, by thanking Dr. Shobna, our president, who always has a very meticulous and perfection-driven sessions. Everything is always very meticulous and perfectly 
organized. Thank you. Dr. Thank Devi you. whose valuable inputs are always appreciated and her mere presence is always special. I <laughs> 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 love you when you are out. Thank you, thank you very much for all the kind words. I I enjoyed myself and thank you. I've always enjoyed interacting with Dr. Ram Raju. Um, I think um, you know, like I mentioned so many times before, you know, he's given me so many ideas. And whenever I'm in trouble, I always give you a call, sir, and uh, to discuss what I can do further. So thank you so much. I've enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.